Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is, of course, John Corstein. I am uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum. And today we're going to talk about a fabulous story, uh, which is all about the beginning of commerce raiding during the Civil War and also the beginning of the career of the greatest captain of commerce raiding ships, Raphael Semmes, a very rakish sounding name for a very rakish individual who we'll learn all sorts about. In this picture you see before me in the foreground is Semmes himself, and that picture was actually taken on board the CSS Alabama. Uh, hey John, in, can you uh, can you share your screen, John? Oops. Okay. So, anyway, back to my story. Um, uh, so anyway, so at the outbreak of the Civil War, the Confederacy has no Navy. It is uh, really uh, overwhelmed by the Northern um, Industrial Complex in many, many ways. So how is the Confederate Navy going to strike back? Uh, now, they want to buy ships in Europe, but in the meantime, in 1861, they have to develop some type of way of injuring uh, Northern commerce. And the Secretary of the Navy of the Confederacy is Stephen Russell Mallory, a very roly-poly guy. You know, every morning he wakes up and drinks uh, champagne and eats oysters, you know, for breakfast. So he's a go-getter. And so Mallory uh, actually, at the beginning of the war, um, recognizes that the Confederacy has to fight this war like no other Navy has fought it. Number one, they needed to get ironclads. Number two, they needed to use rifled guns and you know rams on their ships. And finally, they needed to begin what is known as commerce raiding. In other words, attacking the, in this case, the Northern merchant ships. So uh, basically the Sumter, some some tur is going to be a ship that um, is going to be selected by Sims and he will convert it into a commerce raider and then go on and capture 18 ships. So Raphael Sims, who is he? Well, he was born in uh, Charles County, Maryland, and uh, on the 27th of September. 1809 and he uh, came from a, a gentry family uh, actually uh, he's cousin of a confederate general uh, Paul Sims also a union naval captain known as Alexander Sims he is orphaned when he is young so his uncles uh, particularly uh, um, Benedict will really look out for him and he will get um, actually Sims at the age of 17 after graduating from Charlotte Hall Military Academy. He then will actually uh, um, join the U.S. Navy at age 17. Uh, now of course he's going to be a midshipman and he um, would actually take a leave of absence to study the law and he passes the bar in 1834 in Maryland. And so while he's on shore duty, um, which is often having a naval rendezvous is one thing he did. In other words, a naval rendezvous is where we recruit um, uh, sailors to join uh, the US Navy in that case. So while he's on shore duty, he becomes, you know, practices his law at the same time, believe it or not. And that will bring him up to Cincinnati, where he'll marry the daughter of an um, ardent abolitionist, Anne Elizabeth Spencer of Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, I have to tell you, even at this time, Sims is a die-hard Southerner. Maryland is a Southern state, so as a result of that, uh, you know, he really believes in states' rights, etc. So, um, Sims is going to be promoted to lieutenant in 1837. Uh, as a result of that, um, he will um, start to receive certain uh, really nice postings. And, and actually, in 1845, he will take command of his first ship. 
and this is the cursed ship known as the USS Summers. Now, I think um, we talked about the Summers before, but the Summers is actually a uh, brig that um, during one of its cruises, it's coming back from Africa, nearing Virgin Islands. Alexander Seidel McKenzie is the captain, and he actually uh, will charge um, uh, one of his midshipmen, Philip Spencer, whose father is Secretary of War at the time, with mutiny. Uh, Spencer says it's just a joke, but they all, the officers all agree, no, he's serious, and so he will be hanged on the yardarm of the summers, right? Creates a huge incident. Well, so it's a cursed ship because that's the only real mutiny in the U.S. Navy. Consequently, Semmes will take command of the ship right when the Mexican War begins. And, and so he will be assigned uh, to the home squadron, which is the main squadron on the East Coast. And as a result of that, he will serve in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, I have to tell you, he will go on one special um, uh, cruise down to the Yucatan Peninsula with Flag Officer Duncan Ingram to see if Yucatan Peninsula wanted to separate itself from Mexico. This is when we're at war and that would weaken Mexico. And so the, the citizens of Yucatan say yes. Summers comes back, goes on blockade duty, and on December 8, 1846, while chasing a Mexican blockade runner, a squall all of a sudden comes up and it hits the Summers at the wrong angle, despite some superior leadership or seamanship, as I should say, the vessel is going to flounder. And Sims barely escaped drowning himself. 44 of his crew of 80, <coughs> excuse me, are going to be wrecked, um, saved by some British, French, and Spanish nearby ships. And in fact, in the aftermath, you know, every time you ship goes down, you have what is known as a court of inquiry. And so Sims will be praised by the court of inquiry and say he was excellent in the manner in which he handled his ship in such a difficult circumstance. I gotta tell you a secret about Sims. Sims was a great sailor. And in fact, uh, he did not like steamers at all. And in fact, he said, uh, steamships ruin the ma majesty of, of sailing ships of war, but they actually added to what they could do. So he then gets turned over to the 44-gun frigate, the Raritan, commanded by French Forrest. French Forrest is going to be given the charge of organizing the landing near Veracruz at Coralado Beach. And uh, this is a very narrow anchorage. So Sims will actually work directly under Forrest because what they did, they land troops as those boats went back to pick up more troops. The supply ships would come in. And so there was this great rotation that allowed the United States to build up its forces so that it could uh, uh, actually invest Veracruz. It was a long, arduous pro process. French Forest praises Sims for his industry. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, he, you know, is already being noted in dispatches. Now, I got to tell you, uh, he gets special, sent on a special mission by French Forest uh, with a letter to the Mexican authorities to request the release of the POW past midshipman R. Clay Rogers. And he has to go to Winfield Scott to get permission to get an escort. Winfield Scott, Lieutenant General, Commander of the Army, um, moving against Mexico City. Um, his nickname is Old Fuss and Feathers. And of course, he doesn't like anyone from the Navy telling him what to do. He doesn't want to waste an escort on taking Sims uh, to Mexico City to leave this message. So as a result of it all, um, you know, 
Semmes will just stay with the army as they march upon Mexico City. In fact, on September 13th, 1847, Semmes will be there with Will Brigadier General William Worse um, attack on what we call the San Cosmos Gate, which, you know, Mexico City had all these causeways, and then they had uh, gates or gratas that defended the entrance into the city. Well, there's Stymie trying to get across this causeway, and so Ulysses S. Grant takes a mountain hauser, which is a small gun you can take apart, and Raphael Sims takes one as well. Grant is on the left-hand side of the bridge. Sims is on the right. They are able to get up into the cathedral and use their howitzers to fire down on the Mexican artillery defenders. And as a result of that, the Americans uh, get to, um, and here's a nice picture of Sims, as you can see. Actually, that flag we think is in the Mariners Museum. Uh, this is the Summers. I sometimes forget to pass my slides. There's the hanging Philip Spencer. Um, and this is the capsizing of the uh, Summers. And uh, uh, so this is the Raritan. And this is, of course, thanks to Sims, thanks to Ulysses S. Grant, they will be heroic in how they bring these howitzers up. And you can see the towers in the back and enabling the Americans to capture Mexico City. Uh, the war is over. Now, this is the parade. Winfield Scott is on uh, the white horse, of course, because he's the great hero. So when the war is over, Semmes is going to actually uh, write a book called Service Afloat and Ashore During the Mexican War where he explains everything he thought. Then he also wrote a book about Winfield Scott's march on Mexico. Sims did not like Winfield Scott, so it's a real rebuke towards Scott. Luckily, Sims is in the Navy, not the Army. So anyway, in 1855, he's going to be promoted to commander. And then the next year, 1856, they just organized what's known as the Lighthouse Service where they divided America's coastline into 12 districts. And so that they could maintain the lighted buoys, uh, lighthouses, et cetera, as aids to navigation. This is uh, lock and step with what is called the Coastal Survey. So we have better ways of getting in and out of port. Sems will be stationed in Washington, DC. And all of a sudden, as we all know, war clouds come across the nation. And as soon as Abraham Lincoln is going to be promoted or elected as commander of, uh, or president of the United States, Sims will resign his commission and he goes down. He was born in Maryland, but he actually had really enjoyed living in Mobile Bay had a home nearby, and so he declares himself an Alabaman, and, and when and he joins uh, the Confederate Navy. Now I got to tell you, um, at first, here's you got this dynamic officer, and what is the Confederacy going to do for it? Now remember, at this time, the capital of the Confederacy is going to be in Montgomery, Alabama. Sem shows up, and. Jefferson Davis actually says, well, I want you to go up north and buy a bunch of cannon and arms and ammunition. Well, you know, I think everyone knows the war's coming. And if you're from the north, why are you going to sell weapons to the south? And so it's a failed mission. When uh, uh, actually Sims comes back from that mission, he will be named as head of the Lighthouse Service for the Confederacy. Sims is upset as can be, so he goes and sees Stephen Russell Mallory, Secretary of the Navy for the Confederacy, says, looky here, um, you know, you're wasting my time by putting me on the Lighthouse Board. What we really should be doing is commerce rating, attacking the union, um, a commerce uh, and uh, industrial complex uh, by waging war at sea against Northern 
merchant ships. Wow. You know, uh, Mallory and he has this great discussion and Mallory knew something about Sims. He knew he had exhibited uh, very valued leadership skills, such as being resolute, capable, and brave. These qualities made Sims the perfect officer to begin the Confederate commerce raiding campaign to Sims, also to him, a unique opportunity to fly for the first time at sea, the Confederate flag, oh my gosh. So, meanwhile, now, this is in Montgomery, Alabama, where Sims is talking to uh, Mallory. Meanwhile, down in New Orleans, Captain Lawrence Rousseau, um, who is a former Old Navy member, uh, and he identifies two ships that could have the ability to be transformed into warships. He writes a report surveying the vessels. One is the Habana, and the other one is the Marquis de la Havana. Now, when, as soon as this report shows up, Sems is there, he reads the report, and he uh, says, oh my gosh, uh, you know, the Habana is a perfect ship for me to use to attack the Northern Commerce. And so, right away, Mallory approves the purchase of the Habana, and immediately they rename the ship the CSS Sumter. Now, the Habana was originally built in 1859 at the Byerly Lynn Shipyard in Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania, for James McConnell's New Orleans and Havana Steve Navigate, Steam Navigation Company. They carried mail service, so this ship is relatively fast. She had a speed of 10 knots, and uh, her engines had been built by... Nephi, Levy, and company. And so the engine produced 400 knots to a single screw, which enabled once again, uh, or 400 horsepower to a single screw, enabling 10 knots. Also, um, the Havana was bark rigged and had a length of 184 feet, a beam of 30 feet, and a draft of 12 feet. Now, I gotta tell you, um, this is an advertisement. You can see the McConnell's New Orleans Havana line. Uh, this is 1859. That's the ship that Sims looks at it and says, we can make this into something really great. And so Sims goes down to New Orleans. Mallory gives him the uh, commission to go ahead and uh, convert the Habana, because the problem with the Habana, if you look at this picture, it had a superstructure, it had staterooms, it had all these things that um, were unnecessary, but Sims himself says that the Habana was a good steamship and thought her lines were easy and graceful. She had a, source, a sort of saucy air about her. Oh my gosh. Now, so what he has to do, uh, he's there in New Orleans, they don't make warships in New Orleans. So as a result of that, they struggle with actually converting uh, the Habana into the Sumter. Sems himself has to draw up all the plans. He has to meet with the shipbuilders and actually instruct them on how to complete certain changes. So uh, they get rid of all the superstructure and then they have to build below water tanks, uh, powder magazines, uh, uh, actually um, uh, coal bunkers, uh, because at first the ship only could go five days with coal. So he had to expand the coal bunkers and he did it all himself. He was energetic. Uh, however, as the ship is being converted, Sems then had even greater difficulty of how I'm going to arm it. Now, the only place they made ordinance in the South at that time was up in Richmond, Virginia. And so Sims goes to a nearby foundry, Phoenix Foundry, and says, hey, can you make me uh, four 24-pounder uh, bronze howitzers? They said, yeah, sure we can, but, you know, by the end of May, they are unable to do it. But Sims 
knows that Gosport Navy Yard had fallen and the Navy Yard had over 1,200 pieces of naval ordnance, including almost 300 nine-inch Dahlgren guns. So Sims goes to Mallory, says, I need stuff from Gosport. Mallory approves, sending four um, uh, nine inch or four 32 pounder naval shell guns and one eight inch shell gun, Dahlgren, which will be used as a pivot gun. However, the Confederate railway system is so bad that, you know, it, he actually has to track the shipment of the guns and directing them all the way to New Orleans because they have to go from one railway line to the next. And so as a result of that, um, finally, on June 3rd, 1861, Sims has assembled 107 officers and crew, and he is ready to test his guns, commission his ship, and you can see it doing so here in the middle of um, New Orleans Harbor. Now, you have to realize, the Federals had established a blockade of the southern coastline. And they recognized there were certain key ports that needed to be blockaded first, because the U.S. Navy had a limited supply of ships when the war broke out. And uh, they only had 28 steamers, which are the most effective to blockade a place. Well, they knew New Orleans was one of those key sites. So we see here one of the blockaders that are going to be at New Orleans, and that is the USS Brooklyn. It was commissioned in 1859. Uh, it could make 12 knots, and it was armed with one 10-inch shell gun on pivot and then 29-inch Dahlgren guns in broadside. Wow, this is more powerful armament than the Sumter. It was also faster than the Sumter. And everyone knows that this ship, the Sumter, you know, there's no, I would have to say, I should do a program in the future about secret service and so forth. There are no secrets, you know, because in the newspapers, the New Orleans Big Union, they are saying, oh my gosh, we're building this ship. And of course that information gets to the Federals. So the Brooklyn is commanded by uh, Commander Charles Henry Poor, who knew all about the Sumter's plan escape. He even knew, now there are three passes to get out of the Mississippi River through the Delta, and he even knew that Sumter was going to take the pass to the Ultre. Uh, I don't speak French, but that's as close as I'm going to get. So anyway, um, and Poor was excited because he was determined to capture that ship. And he knew with his extremely greater firepower and speed that he could blow the Sumter out of the water if given a chance. Just so happens by a quirk of luck that on June 30th, 1861, a fisherman in an oyster boat, uh, that's what Sam says, uh, comes alongside the Sumter and, Sumter and said, oh my gosh, that big bad Brooklyn has gone off chasing some other ship and the pass is open. Sims immediately fires up his ship, runs out the pass, and the Brooklyn sees that from afar and begins to take chase. Well, I have to tell you, the Brooklyn is starting to gain on the Sumter because of, you know, its superior speed and is just about getting in range. But Sims, using his excellent seamanship as a sailor, is able to take advantage of the winds and break away from the Brooklyn. And his ship now is free to sail the seas. Well, I got to tell you, this is a very lucky escape. And so uh, as soon as he escapes, you know, on July 3rd, 1861, they capture their first ship, which is known as the Golden Rocket. The ship was in ballast, so it was worthless, you know. So it was captured, the crew was removed, and it was set afire. Now, I want to tell you, Sims was called a pirate, and we'll go into that in a little bit. 
But the bottom line is, is that he at gave these POWs um, the same food as his crew members had. He treated them with respect. Um, so anyway, so as they get ready to burn the golden rocket, Sims will write the burning ship with the Sumter's boat in the act of shoving off from her side, the Sumter herself with her grim black sides lying in repose like some great sea monster in the sleeping sea were all brilliantly lighted. The flames could be heard roaring like the fires of a hundred furnaces in full blast. Oh my gosh. Over the next three days, he's going to capture burned or bond. And let me just explain bonding. What they said is that, okay, your ship can go away. You're going to sign a little statement that when the war's over and the Confederates win, so they thought, uh, that you have to pay us the value of your ship and we'll let you go. So uh, that's exactly what Sims does. Uh, you know, it's amazing in, in, you know, like three days, he captures all these ships and actually news comes out because he drops off the POWs in Cuba, continues to raid around the Caribbean, going as far south as uh, Brazil. Um, and so, but the North gets wind of all this. In fact, the depreciations against Northern commerce interests prompted business leaders to call for some type of action. U.S. Navy's dispatched several ships to try and track down the Sumter. And actually, the USS Ir Iroquois, a steam screw sloop of war, um, will actually trap Sims in the harbor of St. Pierre in Martinique. Oh my gosh, what are you going to do? Because the Iroquois, of course, has a broadside of 20 guns, 9-inch Dahlgrens, a pivot gun. I mean, it, it, once again, the Sims is in trouble faster ship than Sims. So anyway, in working with the French authorities who were somewhat at that time uh, very favorable of the Confederacy, Sims is going to be able to make his escape on the evening of November 23rd, 1861. Well, I got to tell you, Sims is going to then cross the Atlantic. However, time is running out for this ship uh, because number one, you, he's got to constantly find a source of coal. Number two, a ship at sea, the boilers need work on, the engines need, or the machinery needs help. The ship's bottom actually should have been scraped. So what's gonna happen is that he's gonna put in at Cadiz, Spain, um, and um, ask to have fuel and machinery repair. Now, the US diplomats, uh, are in Spain, they're in Morocco, they're everywhere. They're trying to say, those guys are pirates. You can't help them at all. If you help them, the United States will look upon it as an act of war. So the Spanish authority says, you get out of here. And so Sims will make his way to Gibraltar. Now en route, he will, dis he, he will capture two additional ships and burn them the light of bouncing off the Atlas Mountains. Oh my gosh, it was this huge just statement. The Sims then took the Sumter into Gibraltar. The English were a little more favorable. However, all of a sudden, showing up outside of Gibraltar are gonna be three uh, steam screw sloops of war. The Kearsarge, which we'll talk about on another lecture, the Chippewa, and the Tuscarora, and they uh, will trap Sims. Sims has no other options but to decommission his ship. He will then um, uh, pay off his crew, as it said, and sell the ship um, so that, uh, um, you know, uh, it, it would make some more money for the Confederacy. I have to say, um, that the recreated Sumner, uh, recreated Sumter, 
will actually become the blockade runner Gibraltar of Liverpool and make one successful run into Wilmington. It will later uh, sink in a storm in the English Channel, 1867. Sems, meanwhile, goes back to London. Then he heads to back to the Confederacy, stopping at Nassau in the Bahamas. He'll receive orders to return to London because there, Commander James Bullock had arranged for the construction of several ships, especially one known as Hull number 290. So that new commerce raider would be the great Alabama. Sems is given command of it. So as one observer said, old beeswax, as his crew liked to call him, because he kept twisting his mustache. I was going to do that today before the program, but it's just not me. So anyway, so we knew that old beeswax was going to soon resume his attacks on Union commerce in a much more powerful fashion. The Sumter proved that the Confederate commerce raider was rather effective in causing financial damage among Northern business interests. So furthermore, because you had to detach a lot of ships to try and track down the Sumter, that meant that um, you had uh, the opportunity to take ships away from the blockade. And some of the best ships, like the Kearsarge, uh, had to be detached from service off Charleston, Savannah, uh, New Orleans at the time. So in just over six months, Sims had destroyed or bonded 18 ships. Mallory knew, as Sims did, that this type of uh, assault on northern commerce had to continue. The Sumter, Sumter was the first Confederate commerce raider, the first Confederate ship to fly the flag at sea. However, another ship, uh, the Nashville, we will get the um, record of being the first Confederate ship to fly the flag in an European port, Liverpool, which is another story for another time. But I want to tell you what Sems has proved because of his daring, his capability, his fortitude. I mean, he kept himself a love from the crew, and yet he's managed to maintain discipline and a, a spree de corps that made the Sumter a, a, a pirate ship, a ghost ship that worked across the seas and damaged the Union in a way that they ill could afford to lose their merchant marine. So that's the study of Raphael Sims and the CSS Sumter. Uh, Sims is just, when you think about his survival of the sinking of the Sumner, when you think about his determination, his knowledge of actually the workings of the ship, how to convert his ship and himself. He's not only going to be commander of the ship, he's the naval uh, constructor. He is the orchestrator of getting supplies and ammunition and guns. He does it all to make the Sumter uh, one of the more successful Confederate commerce raiders that shakes fear throughout the North. So anyway, uh, I'm John Corsi once again, uh, Director Emeritus of the USS Monitor Center at the Mariners Museum and Park. And I'm happy now to answer any questions that y'all might have. Okay. All right, John. Uh, so yeah, we got, we got a couple here. Um, so uh, first question here is how often did these ships use sails versus steam? Well, uh, basically, if you are sailing in the Atlantic, you're going to rely on your sails. Um, coal is in limited supply. Um, you're going to have to use it. However, every much of the equipment of the ship, like the condensers and so forth, needed steam power. So they did have to keep the engines um, banked, so to speak. So not enough steam up to operate the propeller, but enough to um, operate the different systems that were necessary to operate the ship. So, but yes, they mostly use sails. In fact, the escape from the Brooklyn, Sems relied on sails to give his ship that edge to escape 
the much faster Brooklyn. Great. Um, can you also uh, switch to that slide that has your contact information? So that way people oh, can uh, see that while we're talking about this. Okay, there you go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you're, I want to tell you, you know, next week I'm going to be talking about um, um, the uh, Dutch invasion of um, Hampton Roads uh, during the Second and Third Anglo-Dutch Naval Wars. Really great story. Uh, and I, uh, uh, and I'm happy, as many of you all know, uh, to answer any question. I have people ask me questions from Denmark and Arizona and everywhere. And so I'm happy to go into detail about any topic. You also are really welcome to suggest other topics for me to discuss. Um, I uh, uh, am quite happy to you know, develop a blog. Now I'm already scheduled all the way through, I think the end of March. So I can't give your request, um, you know, attention until you know we get into uh, the spring of 2021. It seems a long way away, but um, there are literally hundreds upon hundreds of stories of the Civil War at sea that I'd be so happy to share with you all. Great. Um, okay, let's see here. We got a couple of really long ones here. Uh, we'll you, we'll get to those in a moment. Um, here's one, uh, how did the Northern, how was the Northern states viewed by foreign governments when they made demands during the Civil War? Well, uh, it all depends on the size of your Navy, right? Now, Spain, um, has Navy was out of date. Um, so Morocco didn't really have much of a Navy, so they could be cowed by an American gunboat, um, or sailing sloop or a steamship uh, sloop uh, they could be cowed by all those guns and the ability of the americans because you know at the end of the civil war the americans are going to have over a 600 ship navy so they expand rapidly so the nations that didn't care what the english said would really be the french and particularly uh, the british uh, uh, the British had a much larger Navy, and so they uh, could say, well, too bad. Anyway, the French, under Emperor Louis Napoleon, um, actually was having designs on conquering Mexico in 1861, and so he didn't care what the Americans had to say. And there are certain laws of neutrality that existed by conventions during the 19th century, and so the English tried to pay attention to them, but then they also tried to look the other way. And actually, they built several ships in England for um, Confederate use. They were building ironclads there, um, which had the Confederates gotten the so-called large rams, uh, they would have they would have outdone any monitor. The French actually build an ironclad for the Confederacy, which is known as the Stonewall that doesn't make it to um, North American waters until after the war was over. But you see the, the, these two larger industrial nations. Whereas Russia, who just fought the French and the English during, or the British during the Crimean War, they actually send a, a ship uh, or a fleet saying, oh, we love you America, showing their support. Um, but the Russians didn't have any ironclad, so I don't think it really mattered. It was kind of just a show of, we appreciate what you're doing. So anyway, there you right. go. That kind of that ties into this next question, which sort of answered. Uh, did the British favor the Union? And if they did, did any of their ships engage the Confederate raiding ships? No, no British ship in, engaged any... Um, Confederate commerce raider. They did not favor the Union. Remember, the United States is a rising industrial power. Uh, in 1860, uh, in Great Britain had was the leading industrial power. And so America was, rap or the United States was rapidly catching up. So any type of dislocation of the industrial powerhouse of the United States, i.e. separation of the United States, the Confederate States 
United States, would mean that um, England could maintain its leadership in industrial fashion. So they looked upon their American cousins with disdain, actually. Um, especially, you have, and I'll do this story later, known as the Trent Affair, where Great Britain almost went to war with the United States during the Civil War in 1862. So they did not really favor the United States, although the American uh, ambassador to England, um, Charles Adams, son of John Quincy Adams, um, who really harangued them constantly saying, hey, they're building ships or you're sending cannon to the Confederacy. That's against the law. He says, well, we didn't know that. Or you know, they tried to pass it all off as long as they sure. could. That's a whole big story. So maybe I'll do that another time. Great. Uh, this is a bit of a long one. Um, <clears throat> It says, uh, Sims made his hatred for Winfield Scott very clear. Uh, you mentioned that Sims was a diehard Southerner, but Scott was also a Southerner as he was from Virginia. However, because the Whig Party favor favored centralization of, federal, of a federal army, Scott was a Whig and indeed possessed political aspirations of his own during the Mexican War. Was Sims' hatred for Scott a politically motivated one? Um, I would say yes. Uh, Simmons was a so-called Democrat, and um, uh, the Whigs were more, uh, uh, you know, more. Um, how could I say they they looked at um, trying to build roads for America, do things like that. The Democrats really were pro-slavery. They were pro-state rights, and so <clears throat> there is a political difference. Sims' dislike of, and yes, Winfield Scott was born in Petersburg. Yes, he lived there. However, he believed in the Union. And that's one of those stories that tore America apart. Here are these people who served the U.S. Army their whole lives, and they're forced into a decision. Scott decides to stay loyal to the Union. Whereas the person he wants to have in charge of the armies in the field for the Union, Robert E. Lee, makes the decision to go south. So it was a very difficult. Sims wrote it about um, Winfield Scott, not as much for a political statement, but chastising Scott for the missed opportunities and how he ran his campaign. Um, and, and yes, Scott ran against Zachary Taylor. Uh, and lost. So, uh, you know, that's just too bad. Um, so, uh, yes, yeah, so Sim's book is uh, Diatribe, uh, all because um, Scott, um, you know, ignores him, so to speak, and treats him with disdain. Nobody could treat Sims with disdain. I'll just leave it at that. Fair enough. Um, so uh, here's another question. Uh, uh, so you mentioned about Sims and Scott had some animosity um, before and after the Mexican War. Was there a significant inter-service rivalry between the U.S. Army and Navy at this time? Um, and also, did that translate to the Confederate Army and Navy? Uh, and then it says here, I suppose the benchmark for this question would be the infamous Japanese Army and Navy rivalry during World War II, which was well, pretty terrible. <laughs> The, the, the naval rivalry existed in throughout Europe once we get really into the um, age of mercantilism, late 17th century, early 18th century. Um, the navies often said, well, we do more than you. The army would say, oh, no, we do more than you. Uh, you can't do without us. We can do without you. So the animosity was rife. And during the Civil War, the Confederate Army dominated everything because the Confederate Navy um, did not achieve some of these great victories. You know, all these resources were being spent on building ironclads that didn't do anything, but they were a force in being. So the Army would look down on the Navy. So there was this inner uh, service rivalry that would date all the way back uh, to uh, well, the revolution, but really the War of 1812, because, you know, the Navy says, well, look, we win all these victories and the Army is worthless. You know, we have our own Marines. We can do anything we want. You guys can't. 
And uh, so those are the type of, it's just like the Army Navy game today between um, West Point and Annapolis. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, a rivalry that will always exist. In today's military, of course, uh, we recognize the real need to be unified. Back in the old days, it was, uh, in fact, Josiah Tatnall, later commander of the Virginia, would be ordered by Mallory to follow the orders of General Joseph Eggleston Johnson, commander of all the Confederate troops in Virginia. And Josiah Tatnall writes back and says, how dare you do this to me? How dare you taint my, my honor? for a salt like me to serve under a man of the land is disgraceful and I will resign my commission if you make me do it. Well, you know, so that kind of encapsulates it. It's a great letter, um, which is in the official records and uh, it really shows, uh, you know, how much they disliked each other. Okay. Great. Uh, all right, let's see here. Um... Here's the next one. Uh, I've read somewhere that uh, Sims had a reputation of being a sea lawyer. I'm sure that comes from his detractors. Is there any truth to that? A, I didn't get the... A sea lawyer? Sea lawyer, S-E-A? Yeah, like water. Uh, well, that, that's obvious where he practiced law. And um, practiced law in Maryland, um, which was um, a huge... Uh, uh, Maritime State, Mobile Bay. Um, uh, he was, Simmons was a brilliant individual. Let's just put it that way. Not only a lawyer, but a ex, you know, tremendous leader of men. So um, I don't know if he had the greatest reputation of lawyers in America. That probably fell on the shoulders of Edwin Stanton uh, or um, uh, Montgomery Blair. But, you know, uh, he was a lawyer in maritime circles. Right. Um, here's one. Uh, did Lincoln micromanage the Navy or did he give them free reign? Oh, no. Uh, he, he really gave them pretty free reign. He, I know, went to the Navy Department when um, the CSS Virginia came out and sank the Congress in Cumberland. Everyone's having a fit. And Gideon Wells says, don't worry, we've got our own ironclad going down there. Um, uh, Edwin Stanton asked, well, how many guns does it have? He says, two. And, you know, uh, he, Edwin Stanton has a fit. But Gideon Wells managed, especially thanks to uh, the support of Gustavus Vasa Fox, the Assistant Secretary of Navy, they really ran the Navy Department to an extent that Lincoln didn't, you know, notice, uh, nobody has, to, Lincoln doesn't have to actively go in and fire, he fires generals, but he actively doesn't have to go in and fire admirals, because Gideon Wells would recognize, well, this guy can't do it, and so I'm going to replace him, and he does that several times uh, during the war. So, uh, yeah, back to that inner uh, service rivalry, you know, the first amphibious operation of the Civil War, <clears throat> which is the capture of Hatteras Inlet. Um, actually, Butler, Ben Butler, tries to take, um, uh, you know, I captured the forts, where it's really the Navy, commanded by Flag Officer Silas Horton Stringham. And so when the newspapers say all this stuff about Butler, and they don't mention Stringham, who actually puts his ships in an eclipse movement and destroys the forts, he says, no man who sailed the seas ever has been disenchanted by the lack of recognition for the service of the sea. And he resigns his commission. You know, well, that was, uh, so there, there was a lot of that going on, let me tell you. And of course, Butler was a big guy into PR. So, you know, but anyway, you'll see it time and time again. Lots of dramatic people, it sounds like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And all these stories have, you know, I mean, I could have gone into great detail about um, Commander Poor because he was a really go-getter. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really amazing. Like, we talked about um, uh, several officers in the past, and you start to realize that they just, you know, uh, 
had that leadership quality that they had spent 20 to 30 years building. And Civil War comes, people like Farragut, people like Buchanan are able to stand up and do what they need to do at the time. Great. Uh, so I got another question for you. Uh, what was Sam's post-war career? Oh, well, he goes down to Mobile. Um, he then gets the job as head of what will become uh, LSU. Um, he tries to run uh, LSU like a ship, um, and so they don't like that. So he goes and uh, actually is president of an insurance company for a short while. He then goes back to Mobile. See, his past haunts him. When I say his past haunts him, his past of being a pirate, right? His past of being a stern captain of vessels at sea. Uh, a man who's courageous, who also believes in himself. So he doesn't take kindly for someone saying, well, don't you think we should teach this course instead of that? You know, something, well, you know, I'd hang you if I could. Um, and so, and so Sims ends up as a lawyer in Mobile. They love him in Mobile Bay. Um, and actually he will die um, from food poisoning, um, from bad oysters. It said bad oysters, it's also said bad shrimp. So that's his career, you know. Wow. That, uh, yeah, you gotta, get, you gotta get fresh seafood. You gotta get free, fresh seafood. <laughs> uh, the Sam's, Sam's is proof of that. You, know, you got to make sure it's an R in the month to eat oysters. And, right. you know, I don't know about the shrimp, but, um, you know, it's better to catch them yourself, you know. So, uh, but it was, um, Sam's was a dynamic person. His book about his service during the Civil War is really one of the beginnings of the lost cause because it's service afloat during the war between the states. And it's the first time that term is really gonna be used in the post-war era. So, you know, he is a true believer in the lost cause and helps create that myth um, that um, the South only lost because of uh, superior manpower, industrial strength, all the real reasons why they did lose, but um, they're overwhelmed by superior numbers. And so, um, so Sems is, is often credited and he is like an unreconstructed <laughs> Confederate. In other words, he doesn't, he doesn't want to deal with the reconstruction politics. Uh, he's very anti those in the post-war era. So, uh, that also is going to haunt him in a certain extent. What's um, next? Cool. So we, yeah, it looks like we've got about three questions left. Uh, so uh, this one here, it says, um, you kind of touched on this. Uh, how closely did Sims follow the Articles of War in relation to the treatment of uh, his passengers that he uh, captured? Um, and then did he press them into service? And then uh, did he send any freed black men into slavery into the South? Uh, number one, he never brought a ship back into a Confederate port. In other words, the Alabama never went into a um, enemy port. And he did not fight against, um, um, he did not fight against the U.S. Navy other than one battle, which you can go read my blog about the USS Hatteras. He sank that um, in January of 1863. There actually were several African-American uh, crew members on board and they uh, would actually be, end up with the rest of the crew being dropped off in Jamaica. So Sims um, treated these um, POWs, as we would call them, as, um, you know, he'd feed them the same thing. He didn't put them in chains, you know, and, and what he'd try to do is like he'd capture a bunch of ships, burn them, and then he bonded bond a ship and put everybody back on that ship so he wouldn't overtax his crew. But you got to realize every time he stops a ship, he takes all their coal, he takes all their food, and then he burns them, right? Or if he's bonding it, he doesn't do that. So he's an epitome of 
a, a kind gentleman. He even sends ships over to save sailors during the sinking of the Hatteras. Um, so, but one thing he would do is when he captured these people, right? He'd say, ah, you know, welcome on board the CSS Alabama. Do any of you all want to join my crew? And some would, you know. Uh, that happened several times for the Shenandoah, I know, but also for the Alabama. So you would be given an opportunity because Sims, when he organizes the Alabama, there are no Southerners in the crew. He just has Southern officers. They, they, he, the, the, the English crew that brings the ship uh, away from England um, down to Majorca, uh, he actually offers them he says, I want you all to join the Confederate Navy. I'll go, hmm, then I'm going to give you, uh, you know, 10 golden uh, pieces, uh, you know, uh, $10 pieces for you to sign on to the crew. They all go, huzzah, yeah, we're ready. You know, <laughs> getting paid in gold was a pretty good thing back then. And the opportunity to share in the plunder and what have you. Sems ran a very tight ship, um, and, but nevertheless, um, you know, when you capture these other vessels, you know, I really like that chamber pot. And I think I'm going to take it on boat for me to use. I don't know. Um, but he was a, 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 there are no records that I have read that indicate he treated any captured merchantmen or American seamen. And he does capture some after the sinking of the Hatteras. There's, there's no record of him doing anything unjust or evil, you know, anything like that. Right. Um, okay, uh, so here's a, here was a more of a comment. Um, it said, I think the USS Iroquois was a small sloop of war with only yes. five or six guns, about the same size as the Sum, uh, Sumter, not, not the size of the Brooklyn. Yes, um, it is uh, actually called a gunboat. And, um, so uh, so was the Chippewa that was outside of Gibraltar, but the Tuscarora and the Kearsarge were screw steam sloops of war. So, um, yeah, and, um, you know, using those steam sloops uh, and any gunboat weakened the blockade, as we know. So, yes. Great. All right, looks like we're down to our two, two final questions here. Uh, what was the role of African-Americans uh, or what was the place of African-Americans in the Union and Confederate navies? Uh, do you have numbers on how many served in both? Well, yes, um, we do. And actually, I touched on that about the sinking of the Hatteras. Um, it is estimated anywhere between 10 and 30 percent of a given crew um, would be African-American, especially those gunboats that are serving like in the North Carolina Sounds, the Hunchback. If you look at a photograph of the crew of the Hunchback on the deck, you know, it's, it's a large amount of African-American faces show up. The Monitor has eight um, African-Americans on board. Um, one is African-American, but it says he was a pre-war service as a sa soldier, and the U.S. Army did not accept African-Americans until after the Militia Act, um, which was coincided with the Emancipation Proclamation. But the, our, the Navy had always been colorblind. In fact, I'm going to give a lecture coming up soon about the Battle of Mobile Bay and one of the central images. There is an African-American manning this uh, nine-inch Dahlgren. So yes, um, uh, it was a, um, uh, a very uh, uh, commonplace in the U.S. Navy and also the Confederate Navy. There are examples of African-Americans serving on the Chicora, the Albemarle, and several other vessels. There, um, one person I can't really find a lot of information about who's on the Virginia. He was a cook, and he kind of disappears, but it says he has... Uh, dark complexion, dark eyes, dark hair, which is similar to some of the enlistment papers of African-Americans, but there's no way I could prove it. So uh, I, you, know, you can't say it, but the natives had taught themselves to be colorblind and they continue to be uh, throughout um, the civil war, especially the Northern Navy or the Union Navy. 
Great. All right. So we have our last question here. This is a pretty interesting one. Uh, would Sims have made a difference uh, as commander of the CSS Virginia on both days of the Battle of Hampton Roads? Or was the uh, stalemate in the battle against the Monitor purely technological and seamanship irrelevant? Well, um, would have Sims made a big difference? I have to tell you, um, Buchanan was more dynamic than, or just as dynamic, if not more than Sims. Sims not being, or Buchanan not being there on the second day, Catesby Jones was really a very technical officer. And uh, yet um, he knew that once he saw the monitor and knew what it was, that he needed to get at the Minnesota. And, um, uh, I think had Buchanan been there, he would have tried to ram the monitor sooner than later. He would have ignored the monitor to try and shell the um, Union um, wooden ships. Uh, one, the Minnesota is aground. Uh, there are two others near Fort Monroe. And a guy like Buchanan, a guy like Sims, you know, we're going to go get them. And so... Um, <clears throat> The monitor, because of its flaws, uh, I could say was not a successful, um, um, as, as successful as everyone puts out, but it did stop the Virginia from destroying other wooden ships. Sims is of the same school of officers as Buchanan and Farragut and, um, you know, uh, several others that are just you know, the enemy's there, let's go get them, uh, you know, and the adage of sink before surrender, <clears throat> that's Sims, you know, Sims gets rid of his ship, sells it, since he can't break out. With Alabama, he, his ship is not in really great condition, he still takes on the Kearsarge, which is another whole story that we'll talk about, and uh, Sims, uh, so I think Sims, is the only, he's the second admiral in the Confederate Navy. The first was Buchanan, who was a full admiral, and Sims ranked as a rear admiral at the end of the Civil War when he comes back and takes command of the <clears throat> James River Squadron uh, at Richmond, Virginia. So, um, and he fights the war to the last. He actually organized what's called the Sims Naval Brigade, they leave Richmond with Lee's army. When Lee surrender, Sims doesn't. Sims goes down and joins up with Joe Johnson's army, and then he's forced to surrender. So as I said, he's an unreconstructed uh, individual.